Well, I'm going to be reading this morning from Luke chapter 19, and uh, beginning in verse 41. Immediately after the triumphal entry that we looked at a few weeks ago now, this happened, and it says, And when he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it, saying, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. For the days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you, and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Our Father, we thank you for this, your holy word to us. We, uh, we ask, Father, that as we uh, look at this rather grave passage this morning, that you will give us insight into what it meant at the time and what it, in fact, means to us and to our future as well. We thank you for the insights of your word. We thank you for the fact that you have taken time to give us the communication that, that we cannot say that we didn't have something to live by. Have your whole word, Father, spread before us to give us ability to know and understand the mind of God as much as we can absorb and as much as we can take in this life. And so we would be remiss if we were not taking advantage of that. And in these few verses this morning, we ask that you will open yourself to us. By your Holy Spirit, reveal yourself in a powerful way, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Some of you who have followed baseball and have been around long enough will remember Bob Eucher. Or even if you just go to the movies, you may know Bob Eucher. He certainly made a career out of humor following his baseball career. He wasn't really much of a baseball player. He was a catcher, a fairly good defensive catcher, but his lifetime batting average was 200, which will tell you something about it, which is not good for those of you who, who don't know. Uh, he played for a number of teams, and he said that one time, he said, I knew my days with the Phillies were numbered when I was sent up to pitch hit one day. I turned down toward the third base coach to get a sign, and he turned his back on me and walked away. Rejected, apparently, as useless for their purposes. Something like that is going on in this passage that we have before us today. Though the stakes here are much greater than they were in the case of Bob Eucher. The people of Jerusalem have not outwardly turned their back on Jesus yet as he comes in this triumphal, or better word, a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. They haven't turned their back on him yet, but by week's end, they will kill him as useless for their purposes. It's sad. Huge crowds are greeting Jesus and cheering at this moment is every move. They are acknowledging him as their king and as the prophesied Messiah. And yet, beneath it all, they are acknowledging him as the Messiah that they want, the Messiah of their definition, not the one that he really is. And so, as they cheer, Jesus weeps. It's an amazing picture. Amazing picture. And, and Jesus doesn't just weep. He is absolutely distraught with grief, according to this passage. Now, we have another, there's one other passage in the Bible that speaks about Jesus weeping. It's in John 11:35 35, when Jesus' friend Lazarus dies, and Jesus comes, and it says that Jesus wept. And the word that's used there indicates quiet tears, participating with the crowd who are mourning the death of Lazarus, even as he knows he's going to raise him from the dead in a few moments. This is different. The word used here is the word klio. It's the strongest Greek word for sobbing uncontrollably. It's used of Peter 
in Matthew 26 when he had denied Christ and he went out, as you recall, and wept bitterly. That's the word. It's used in Luke 8 when Jesus comes to the house of Jairus, whose daughter, 12-year-old daughter, has died. And the people who are there are mourning for, him, for her. And they, the same word is used regarding their grief. It's an expression, deep expression of grief. This is not just Jesus casually wiping away a tear. This is Jesus, even as they cheer him coming into the city, sobbing with emotion over the reality of the rejection that the crowd doesn't see yet. He knows. You know, most people who are rejected weep for themselves, but not Jesus. He's weeping for them. Look at verse 42. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. He despairs over the blindness of these people who would recognize him only as a political and physical deliverer, would not recognize him for the purpose for which he really came, which was to forgive them from sin. And so, with tears... With tears, sobbing uncontrollably, he pronounces the judgment which must always come for those who reject Jesus Christ. It's an amazing picture, beloved. It's a, it's a, it's a picture right into the heart of God. You know, God, God is patient, is he not? He is patient. He is kind. He is loving. If, if, if any of us here this morning got what we deserved, we would, we would not be here. The offense that we have had toward a, toward a holy God would have meant the end of us immediately. And yet he is patient and he is kind, but the time comes when judgment was, must ultimately fall for those who will reject him. And the repudiation of Jesus, who is God's instrument to provide salvation, will eventually land the penalty for the sin of all those who reject him on themselves. But never without pain to the heart of God. Does that ever happen? Rejecting Jesus is the worst sin that there is. And it must inevitably result in the kinds of penalties that Jesus pronounces here. Threefold, threefold judgment on this generation of Jewish people that Jesus gives here in this passage. But it foreshadows what would be true of every person who will not submit to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Beloved, the price of rejecting Jesus is very, very high. It's not acknowledged much in our day, but it's a truth of Scripture, and it's a truth we must acknowledge. So what is the threefold judgment that Jesus pronounces here? Well, number one, these people are deprived of God's purposes. They are deprived of God's purposes. They are taken right out of the ultimate plan of God for those who will trust in him and left totally to their own devices, deprived of his purposes. Two phrases catch our attention in this regard. In verse 42, Jesus wishes that this crowd had known on this day, on this day, the things that make for peace. And then in verse 44, he says the judgment is coming because you did not know the time of your visitation. Now that word visitation is a clue. That word visitation could certainly refer to the totality of his earthly ministry. God with us for these amazing 33 years that Jesus was physically here on earth. Amazing period of time. But the fact that he refers to this day very specifically in verse 42 leads us to believe that he is hinting at something beneath the surface. And I think he is referring us back to Daniel chapter 9. So if you would, please, turn with, hold your place here, but turn with me to the ninth chapter of Daniel. The setting for the ninth chapter of Daniel is this. In 606 B.C., God sent the nation of Babylon into Judea to take captive his people. After 300 years of warning them and warning them and warning them against the idolatry which had become their constant habit. As one of Judah's best and brightest, 
Daniel, at the age of somewhere between 15 and 19, was taken captive into Babylon where they were going to teach him in Babylonian ways and raise him up as one of the brightest that they could find in the land of Judah. So Daniel is taken off for service in Babylon through God's providence and through God's faithfulness and through God's blessing. Daniel becomes eventually number two very quickly in the land of Babylon. Number two to the king Nebuchadnezzar. It's an amazing story. You can find it in Daniel chapters 1 and 2. Now fast forward 70 years. Daniel is now a high official in the government of the Medes who have come and taken over Babylon. He's still in Babylon, but he is now in a different government. But one day as he is in his devotions reading, he reads from the from the book of Jeremiah, the prophecies of Jeremiah that had somehow made their way to him. And he reads the fact that God had pre pre prescribed that this captivity in Babylon would be for 70 years. This is great news because the 70 years are almost up. And so Daniel begins to pray and he confesses his sin and the sins of the people to the Lord and he begins to ask the Lord to fulfill his promise and to, re and to renew them to their homeland and to do away with the captivity that they are under. In response, God does an amazing thing. He sends the angel Gabriel. And in verses 24 through 27, we have an announcement of God's future plans for Israel in a sort of cryptic overview that he gives to Daniel at that period of time. So in Daniel chapter 9, in verses 24 through 27, we have this amazing prophecy, which is one of the keys, really, to the whole Bible when it comes to prophecy. The prophecy is not an easy one, but the main points are fairly discernible, I think, and easy to follow. First of all, Gabriel says in Daniel 9, verse 24, 70 weeks have been decreed for your people. Literally, that reads 70 sevens, 70 sevens, 70 periods of seven something. Now, every Bible commentator that I know of agrees that is intended to mean 70 periods of seven years each. So here's a seven-year period. Here's another one. We're going to do that until we're up to 70, 70 periods of seven years each, total of 490 years. So we know the length of time that is, has been determined for the people that he calls your people. So that must be the Jewish people, can only be the Jews. This is the 490-year plan, if you will, for the Jewish people. The starting point for this plan is also defined in this passage. He says that this 70 period of sevens, 70 period of seven years each, is going to go from the going out of the word to, to, to restore and to build Jerusalem. Now, shortly after this passage, this, the, the Mede, uh, Median king, Cyrus, Cyrus the Great is well known to secular history, did release the Israelites to go back to their land, but there was no specific mention of building anything at that point in time. But later on in history, we have a specific edict by King Artaxerxes of Persia who came along in 444 BC. On March the 5th, he issued a decree that allowed the Israelites now who had returned to the land to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. And it's specific to the city of Jerusalem that this decree was made. That starts this 490-year time clock, March 5th, 444 BC. Now, when we get to verse 25, the ESV translation is, I believe, a little bit confusing. And so I put on the screen here for you to see from the New American Standard Version, a version of verse 25 and 26 that is true to the Hebrew, the way the Hebrew reads, if you were to look at this passage and read it in Hebrew. I went back first to find out what the Hebrew says and found that the New American Standard translates it simpler and easier than the ESV does to get the points. So I want you to read with me, beginning in verse 25. It reads this way. It says, So you are to know and discern from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, 444 B.C., until 
Messiah, Mashiach, the Prince, until he comes. There will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. So that's a total of 69 of these 70 weeks. 69 of the 70 weeks, 483 years. From the time of the decree until the time when Messiah is going to be on the ground. And then he goes into this division. He says it will be built again with plaza and moat, even in times of distress. <clears throat> I think what he's done there is take the first seven, a uh, period of seven years, 49 years, and say that Jerusalem will be re rebuilt in that period of time. And now he goes another 62 weeks, and he says now Messiah is going to arrive on the scene. So after 483 years from 444 B.C., we expect to see the Messiah that the Old Testament has been looking at, looking for all this period of time that's been prophesied. Now, various attempts have been made to pinpoint that 483-year period. Most notable among those, I think, are two. One is called, as a book called The Coming Prince by a man named Sir Robert Anderson. Sir Robert Anderson was a member of the Scotland Yard, detective in the Scotland Yard, and also a devout Bible student. And so he took a crack at this, and more recently, a professor named Harold Honer from Dallas Seminary has written a book called Chronological Aspects of the Life of Christ. Both of these men have done this. They have tried to figure out what this 483 period really amounts to, taking into account several things, including, first of all, the fact that in Bible prophecy, years are always 360 days instead of the 365 for simplicity, the Bible does this often. You find months often referred to in terms of 30 days. You'll find uh, months in, uh, around the flood referred to, five of them referred to in terms of 150 days. So this is the way the Bible allocates time from a prophetic standpoint. Taking that into account, taking into account the variations of calendars, of which there are a number, even the year 444, maybe 444, or maybe 445, depending on which calendar you're looking at, taking all those things into account, as well as other complexities of time, they've arrived at the fact, both of these men, that the end of that 483-year period would be either 30 or 32 A.D. Now, that's interesting for us because the best historical data suggests that the triumphal entry of Christ, which was uh, occurring on the Sunday before Passover, would have been in 9 Nisan, which is a Hebrew month, late March, of 30 A.D. And that would be potentially right at the end of this 483 years. In fact, I think that's exactly what Jesus is referring to here when he says, you did not know the time of your visitation. I'm here. Your Messiah is on the ground. The things that are prophesied concerning him are here. This prophecy of your people is being fulfilled. They did not know, quote, on this day. This very day, the time of their visitation. What is this? Beloved, if you remember when we went through this, we saw that this is the first time that Jesus actually publicly claims to be the king and the Messiah. Remember that? First time. This is the day that he's offering himself in all of his glory and in all the things that he will do for them to Israel as their king and as their Messiah. And while they were outwardly accepting him, they are going to eventually, before the end of the week, reject him. And in fact, even as the crowds are acclaiming him, the religious leaders of Israel are meeting behind closed doors to plot his death, according to John's gospel. So the nation as a whole, even though certain individuals are accepting him, the nation as a whole is rejecting him. And if you go back to Daniel 9 and look at verse 26, you find that after the 62 years, meaning after the 7 plus 62, the Messiah will be cut off, which is going to happen before the end of this very week. He will be cut off. He will be killed and have nothing and then he says, the people of the prince, and you have to study this a little further, but you'll find that the people of the prince means the Romans. The people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. 
Hang on to that for a moment. We'll come back to it. What's happening here, beloved, is that Jesus is offering himself as the Messiah to the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is rejecting him. Now, more importantly than that, because the nation rejected Christ, he was cut off, but also that 490-year time clock that started in 444 stopped. It stopped at one minute to midnight, basically. It stopped with one period of seven years yet to be fulfilled. A period of seven years that has not yet been fulfilled. Why? Because the nation rejected him. Jesus, God essentially at that point washed his hands of Israel for the moment, not forever, but for the moment, and said, okay, we're going to have a church age. We're going to have a 2,000 plus year church age. We're going to have what Jesus calls in Luke 22, we'll see this in more detail when we get there, the times of the Gentiles. Now, working with Israel as a nation, most of that time they haven't even existed as a nation. All because they rejected their Messiah. But that one week that's left will happen. God keeps his promises. And that's that period of seven years. What is that period of seven years? Well, we know from other scripture that we don't have time to compare today. That period of seven years is yet future to us. That period of seven years is referred to in Daniel 9.27. And it's referred to in Revelation 6 through 19 in great detail. That'll be the time of what Jeremiah calls Jacob's trouble. It'll be the time that Jesus calls the time of the, uh, the, the, the uh, time of the great tribulation in the last half of that seven-year period of time. It's the time when God goes back to work with Israel again to bring them finally to repentance and the recognition of who he is. It's the time when finally, after all that he can bring upon them that he needs to, to open their eyes and open their minds to who he is, what will happen is that's prophesied in Zechariah 12, verse 10 will happen. Zechariah 12, 10 says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. At the end of the seven years of tribulation that's yet to come, the nation of Israel will finally turn as a nation and look at Jesus. And while he is the one mourning this day going into Jerusalem, they will be the ones mourning on that day as they recognize what their, what their, what their ancestors have done in killing their own Messiah and putting him to death rather than accepting him. And at that time, Jesus will come as they accept him and as they make him their king. He will set up his kingdom. You can read about it in Revelation 19 and 20 and 21. Because that day is coming, because God fulfills his promises. What they missed that day, they will have then, but they missed it that day. And therefore, what did they do? This group of people, this generation of Israel, essentially removed themselves from the purposes of God that could have been theirs. All the blessings that are going to come later could have been theirs. But they lost out on all of them. They deprived themselves of a role in God's purposes. So meantime, we've had a 2,000-year duration interruption. But what a tragedy to remove yourself from God's purposes, isn't it? Who would willingly move the, remove themselves from God's purposes? But when you reject Christ, that's exactly what you do. Everyone who rejects Christ has removed themselves from the purposes of God because they are all fulfilled in Christ. Everything that he wants to give to us as human beings, everything that he wants to give to us as people are in Christ. The salvation, the forgiveness, the cleansing, the, re the, the relationship with God can only come in Christ. And when we reject him, we have removed ourselves from his purposes. The curtains were drawn for these people. Unbelief took them out of God's plan. Unbelief will do the same for us. Beloved, rejection of Jesus is an act of war against God. Jesus said it this way in John 17, 3. He said, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You can't separate those two. You can't have God here in some, some semblance of a Jesus over here that was a nice man, a great prophet. They are one. They cannot be separated. The lights go out eventually, and those who reject Jesus, they are deprived of God's purposes. Secondly, those who reject Jesus are devoid of peace. 
they're devoid of peace. Jesus says in verse 42, Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. Isn't that interesting? Everybody wants peace, don't they? This generation of Israel wanted peace more than anything. They wanted peace at home, just like we do. They wanted peace at work. They wanted peace from the captivity that they were experiencing from Rome. It was a horrible captivity that they were under, led to cheating on taxes. If you think your taxes are bad, you should have lived back then, and there was no recourse. They knew they were being cheated. They had no recourse but to pay it because Rome was doing it. The arbitrariness of Roman captivity led to persecution often, and it led to death occasionally. They wanted peace, and yet Jesus weeps. Why? You see, he tells us why. He weeps because on this day that make for peace, they were not accepting it. They thought that peace meant getting the Romans kicked out. Jesus knew better. He's been trying to tell them all the time that he's been on earth, the things that make, make for peace. So what is it that makes for peace? Well, it's the things listed back there in Daniel 9.24. When, when, when God had said, here's a period of 490 years that are determined for your people, and at the end of that time, we, that's going to happen to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness. That's what makes for peace. Peace is an inside job, beloved. It starts inside. And only later works outside. Peace is, starts with God, not man. Peace is a spiritual issue, not a political issue. Before peace can move in, sin has to move out. What causes that? Well, atonement is the only thing that can allow that to happen. We who are a humankind who can ever pay our the, the debt of our guilt to God must have someone who will pay that penalty for us. And the Bible says that penalty was paid by Jesus. That's what can bring peace. But, the, but we have to have this peace with God. Be, everything stems from that. You can't have peace with fellow people unless you have peace with God. Not ultimate peace. So we have to start there. It's exactly what Jesus has been preaching the whole time, Right? repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. They heard the kingdom of, of heaven is at hand, and they liked that. They didn't care at all for the repent part, but that's the key to the whole thing, that we would bring our sins, that we would cast ourselves on the mercy of God and repent for the nature that is within us that is sinful and for the acts outside of us that are sinful so that we can be right with God through the through the through the gift of eternal life that comes through him. Repent for the kingdom of heaven. Re Listen, peace, is, peace, peace with God is not a matter of doing better. It's a matter of repentance. The doing better comes after the fact as a result, not as a root. It's accepting Jesus' death as mine by faith. Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's how peace comes. No Christ, no peace. You reject Christ and you are devoid of peace. You can never have true peace. You can have peace within. You can't have peace with God. You won't have peace with people. Peace comes from him and him alone. You know, Paul says in Ephesians 2.13, he is our peace. It's the person. Peace is a person. It's the person of Christ. When Adam fell, a rupture occurred between man and God, right? Remember how Adam and Eve ran away, <clears throat> hid. They didn't run toward God, with, with whom they had had perfect fellowship up to that point. They ran away from God. Had God not reached out, they would have never come back to him. But God did reach out. But that, that, that rupture with God caused a rupture with everybody, you know? So when God finally confronted them, what did Adam do? Say, oh, God, I did. I sinned. I'm so sorry. No, he said, she did it, right? Isn't that what he said? It alienated him from his own wife. Cain killed Abel. We're still living today with the fact that Isaac is trying to kill Ishmael with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, right? No peace without Christ.
Thomas Merton said, we cannot be at peace with others because we are not at peace with ourselves, and we cannot be at peace with ourselves because we are not at peace with God. That's what Jesus came to provide, peace with God, so that that peace eventually can extend out forever. But there's no peace for Israel because they miss their Messiah can be no peace for us if we miss our Messiah. So they were deprived of God's purposes. They were devoid of peace. What's the third part of the judgment that comes that Jesus pronounces here in Luke, back in Luke 19? They are doomed to God's punishment. Doomed to God's punishment. That's why Jesus weeps. These people do not see, you see, the end result of their rejection. Nobody who rejects Christ sees the end. If they did, they wouldn't reject. They refuse to see. The Bible says they are blind, and they are, and the people of Jesus' time were blind to what was going to happen. They didn't see their end. They didn't see the end of their rejection. For them, life was, after Jesus was killed, life was going to go on as usual. For a time. See, they didn't see the end. Jesus does, because Jesus knows the end from the beginning. It's good to know the end from the beginning, isn't it? And when Jesus looks at the end, here's what he saw in verse 43. The days will come upon you when your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in on every side and tear you down to the ground and you and your children within you and they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Here's the pronouncement of judgment. They wanted the Romans out. Instead, they were going to get the full force of the Romans because they rejected Christ. Consequences always. I mean, you can just mark this down. People can deny it all they want, but consequences always attach to rejecting Jesus. The price of rejecting Jesus is high. Everything that Jesus predicted here came to pass in exacting detail exactly 40 years later. Everything that Jesus said came to pass in exacting detail 40 years years later. And so by, by the time 70 A.D. rolled around, actually by the time 66 A.D. rolled around, the Jews had become such a thorn in Rome's side that they decided they were going to have to do something about it. So they sent troops in, and there was kind of a war, a civil war that went on for about four years. But by the time that went on, Rome said, this is it, we've had enough. They sent Titus, the general Titus, to Jerusalem in 70 A.D. With, with instructions to destroy the city. And what Titus did is exactly what is described here. First, a barricade. A barricade. The word is karax. It originally meant just a wooden stake. But it came to mean any kind of a, of a uh, barricade made out of, out of uh, wood. A, a fortification around a camp. Here it's speaking of uh, a, a palisade put atop a, uh, a, a bank of ground around the city of Jerusalem, a siege uh, affair. They had enough timber in that for the Jews to come out at one point during the siege that went on in Jerusalem and burn it. But when they burned it, the Romans just put up a Roman wall atop that bank that they had put around Jerusalem in order to lay siege to the city. So there was a barricade. Second, he said they would be surrounded and hemmed in, in which they were by siege. The siege went on for five months. That's a long time. Any of you know anything about civil war? Know about the siege of Vicksburg by General Grant? Very difficult city to take. But Grant finally took it by siege. Got close enough that he could put up works around the city, and they were only there for a couple of months. This is five months that this went on in Jerusalem. The Romans hemmed them in on every side. Various failed negotiations happened during that time. Various 
military maneuvers failed during that time on both sides. The Romans would try and break in, not be able to. The Jews would try and break out, not be able to. And so the siege went on for five months. And Josephus, the Jewish historian that lived through all of this, says that there was unspeakable suffering. He says, in every house, the merest hint of food sparked violence, and close relatives fell to blows, snatching from one another the pitiful supports of life. He further reports, need drove the starving to gnaw at anything. Refuge, which even the animals would reject, was collected and turned into food. In the end, they were eating belts and shoes and the leather stripped off their shields. And he describes in detail, I won't go into here, but cannibalism became part of what was happening there. They were hemmed in on every side. Third, Jesus predicted they would be torn to the ground, young and old alike. When the Romans finally broke through the siege of Jerusalem in September of 70 A.D., they had absolutely no mercy. Josephus reports a million Jews were killed. Now, Josephus always exaggerates. You can never take his numbers for truth. But what he's telling you is there were a lot of people who were killed. That Siege started when the Feast of Passover was going on. So there were a lot of people in Jerusalem who ordinarily would not have been there at that point in time. And thousands of them were killed. Thousands of others were sold into slavery. Pregnant women were not exempted, just as Jesus predicted. Josephus reports, while the sanctuary was burning... Neither pity for age nor respect for rank was shown. On the contrary, children and old people, laity and priests alike, were massacred. All of this Jesus is seeing as he sits weeping, overlooking the city of Jerusalem. He knows what's coming. He says one more thing. Jesus predicted there would not be one stone left atop another. Titus had instructed that the temple be left alone. This was the beautiful temple that Herod had built. It was in building for over 60 years. That's how magnificent this temple structure was. Titus had intended to make it a shrine to Caesar, and so he gave instructions to his soldiers, don't harm the temple. But one overzealous Roman soldier tossed a torch that went through the gates of the temple, started the, some of the uh, uh, magnificent uh, curtains that were there in the temple to start on fire and burned the whole thing to the ground. So the temple was built, uh, was burnt. And then Bible scholar Randall Christ tells us what happens next. He says, the decorative gold on the walls, and there was a lot of that, because almost everything that was there was depicted in gold. The decorative gold that was on the walls melted and ran into the seams between the stones. Afterward, in a frenzied attempt to recover the gold, the Roman soldiers tore apart the stones of the temple walls, resulting in a complete desolation of the temple. That's what Jesus saw as he looked into the future that day, a city doomed to God's judgment for rejecting God's Son. Now, if you were to go to Jerusalem today, as a few of us did in 2010, I think it was, you'd be able to see some of the indentations in the first century street that has been uncovered, excavated in the last 10 years. They've escalated, they, they have excavated some of the southwest corner of the temple. And you'd be able to see in the streets that Jesus walked, indentations caused by the great stones that fell. John, I think there's a picture of that that we took when we were there. It's not there. There it is. Uh, you see the indentation in the street that Jesus walked. 
That indentation occurred when the stones that you see in the background were thrown from high up by the Romans in 70 AD when Titus came to destroy Jerusalem. You can still see it today. If you were to go to Rome today, you could walk under the great archway of Titus because Titus went on to become emperor in Rome. And he had a, built, a, a big archway built, and you can walk right through that archway, and you can look back and see pictures depicted in that archway of what he did in Jerusalem, the destruction that occurred there. It's still there to this day. Everything, beloved, just as Jesus said it would happen. What's the point? The point is God knows the beginning from the end. You cannot deny the Word of God. You cannot reject the Son of God and walk away unscathed. You cannot. This destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD was just a foretaste of what's going to happen yet in the future. We'll see more of that when we get to Luke chapter 22. It's just a foretaste. It's just God giving us evidence, I am who I say I am. I do what I say I will do. Do not reject me. Do not reject my love. Do not turn away from me. Do not consider me nothing in your life. Because if you do, you too will be deprived of God's purposes devoid of peace, and doomed to God's judgment. There's no way around it. What God says, God does. Now let me close with this this morning. As we, as we sit here, eternity seems a long way off. The younger you are, the further away it seems. For some of us, it doesn't seem that far away anymore. And I realize that many of you are young and it seems a long way off. But let me tell you, your 70 or 80 years here is going to go very, very fast. The stakes are way too high to be apathetic about Jesus and about God. Judgment fell on these people because Jesus says they did not know the time of their visitation. Well, listen, beloved, the time of our visitation is now. The time of our visitation is today. God says today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. Don't turn away from me. Don't put me off. So we're like the, you know, we're, we're like the officer who pulled over a guy for speeding, you know, and he asked for his license, gave him his license, and as he gave him his license, kind of hoping for leniency, he says, Officer, I hope you noticed yesterday was my birthday. And the officer says, yeah, I noticed that. He said, that's the day your license expired. <laughs> See, we all have an expiration date. We don't know when that date is. That's why today is so important. Louise Kearns woke up last Tuesday morning believing she had whatever time left. And the next day, she was gone. None of us have a guarantee of one more minute, do we? We don't. We don't know when our time is going to be coming up. We don't know our expiration date. So the only day that we have is now. This is the day of our visitation. I don't know where you stand with God, beloved. If I could do it for you, I would commit your life to Jesus because I know you'd be happier now and I know you'd have an eternity with him. But I can't do that. Only you can do that. Like Paul said, I beg you today, be reconciled to God. Don't put this off. I don't know what your doubts are, but if this doesn't convince you, what else could God do to convince you? If you do know Jesus today, isn't it good to know him? Isn't it good to belong to him? Isn't it wonderful to revel in a God who is this mighty and who is this accurate and who is this sovereign? 
Aren't you glad you know him? Doesn't it change your life to know him? Because if you do, it will. That's one way you know whether it's real or not. It changes your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. You have been so kind to warn us. You have been kind enough to give us opportunity. You've been kind enough to illustrate for us the damage that comes from rejecting you. Help us not to do that. To take very seriously what the Son of God has done on our behalf to take our place on the cross. Experience the wrath of God against the sin of humankind laid on him there so that we could experience eternal life as represented in his mighty resurrection and ascension back to the Father. How we long for and look forward to the day we'll be with you. Those of us who know you, Father, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We pray that you will renew our convictions and that you will renew our dedication to you, that you renew our commitment to live a life that is pleasing to you, not because we have to earn favor with you, but because we love you for what you've done on our behalf. Thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.